Hello and welcome to the channel and you are watching Actually 101 with me Prakriti Singh. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. Also hit the bell icon so you never miss an update of my upcoming videos. So today we are going to be doing the main strands of economic thinking which is a new topic that has been added to CB2 and was not previously in CT7. So broadly categorizing economic thinking we can divide it into two parts that is the classical theories and the Keynesian school of thoughts. So the classical theory mainly focuses on the microeconomic concepts like demand, supply and equilibrium price. Whereas the Keynesian school of thoughts focuses mainly on the unemployment and national income point of view. So that is why it focuses mainly on the macroeconomic point of view and macroeconomic object, uh, objectives uh, are achieved using the uh, Keynesian school of thoughts. But classical theory mainly deals with how to value a product. So basically it, uh, it helps in determining how the value of a product should be determined. So, there were three phases in the classical theory which said uh, which uh, the first one being classical approach which, uh, which was founded by mainly Adam Smith and that was developed uh, throughout the late 18th century and the early 19th century. Then came the Marxist social, uh, socialism which was developed by Karl Marx uh, and it was uh, in his book that is known as the Capital which came out in 1867. And then further we have new classical theory which was developed by Jevons and Wallace uh, in the 19th century, the late 19th century, which finally developed the equilibrium price and quantity traded that we study in microeconomics uh, throughout uh, the application part of my microeconomics. Now let's look at all these theories one by one and try to understand how they develop over each uh, other and how we finally came to the equilibrium that we study today. Let's look at what the classical approach said. So, the, uh, so Adam Smith was believed to be the founding father of the classical approach. Now, he believed that the free market is the best way to increase output and increase um, a nation's wealth. He believed that the government in, in intervention or the state intervention is going to reduce the national output and that is why he did not believe in government intervention much. Although they did, the classical economists did believe that the, uh, the government intervention in monopoly would help reduce the monopolist's power and that is why it would help the uh, country's wealth and that is why they did support government intervention only in the case of monopolist powers. Otherwise, they did believe that the free market is the way to go for the economy. Now, there were some uh, economists who did believe that uh, free market was would reduce the nation's wealth and that is why they did say that uh, the government intervention is necessary although the 19th century saw most of the free economy work its way well and increase the government uh, increase the uh, growth output and also reduce unemployment and that is why those thoughts were put off by the uh, results delivered by the country now the main objective of the classical approach is creation and distribution of wealth and by creation and, uh, and by distribution of wealth i mean that they said that distribution of wealth should be based on the contribution made by workers to uh, to the outward and that is how the wealth should be distributed they also believe that growth that means creation of wealth is only, uh, is only possible by specialization and trade now, they draw the conclusion that the value of the product is determined by the cost of production or the value of raw materials input for the production. However, these uh, thoughts were challenged by the new classical economists who said that the value of the product is not determined by the value of the uh, cost of production, but it is determined by the consumer's needs and wants. So basically, the uh, price of a product is not determined by the producer side, but it is determined by the consumer side. That is what the new classical uh, economists said. But these two theories were built upon by uh, Alfred Marshall and who, uh, he developed the uh, demand and supply equilibrium that we study till date. So this was all about the classical approach and now we are going to look at the Marxist approach, uh, Marxist socialism 
who had to say a lot about the labor power and the labor market and how prices should be determined in the labor market. So this is the classical approach. Now we're going to study the Marxist approach and we have a brief idea about what the neoclassical economists said. So we're going to develop a little more about that. Next we come to the Marxist socialism. This was developed by Karl Marx in his book Capital in 1867. He used the labor theory to argue against capitalism. What the labor theory of value meant was the value of product is determined by the number of hours of labor used to produce the product. So basically, if the minimum necessary to survive for labor is uh, say six hours per day of work per, per day and each uh, hour of uh, work is equivalent to one pound, then the real wage rate, the, uh, the real wage rate, the labor power is the number of hours of work that is sufficient to sustain the workers and is a long run wage rate. So the long run wage rate will in this case be six pounds. However, uh, this, this in the capitalist system was the minimum necessary for survival and that depends from country to country and situations to situations. Now what happened was that most capitalists were making labor work in excess of what was the minimum necessary. So, say the wage rate was still six pounds, but they were making the workers work, say, ten hours per day. So, the excess value, that is the surplus value, was enjoyed by the capitalist. That was the value of output minus the labor cost. So, whatever the labor cost was, in excess of what the cap uh, value of uh, output was, that was all enjoyed by the capitalist. What happened after that was that since there was surplus value enjoyed by the capitalists, competition amongst the capitalists would drive most of the capitalists out of the market and into the labor market because there would be so much of competition. So most of the capitalists, uh, the uh, owners of capital will be driven out of the market and they will be pushed into the labor market, which will lead to monopolies ultimately. Now, if there is a lot of monopoly and there are so many people in the labor market, so labor market will gain a lot of power and they will dismantle the entire system. And this will lead to the socialist system, which was developed by social unions and uh, other things like that. So this is what Marxist socialism is, that basically it uh, revolved around the uh, labor theory and the labor power. Labor power is also basically, it's not just physical input, it is also the mental input that the labor puts in. So it involves both music, uh, physical and men mental capacities and skills. So it revolved around the uh, me uh, labor capital, uh, the labor power and labor uh, value. Uh, it revolved around all that so that they said that the uh, value of the output should be determined by the labor cost. However, that was misutilized by the capitalists and that is why the uh, Marxist socialism was not a very big, uh, fruitful uh, answer for uh, valuing the product. And that is why we ultimately came to the newer classical theory that we are going to be studying uh, throughout our microeconomics in CT7 or CT2. So finally, the neoclassical approach was developed in the 19th century by Jevons and Walrus and it was mainly concerned with marginal utility, consumer rationality and maximization of utility. Now to understand this, we need to know what marginal utility, utility, consumer rationality and all these terms are. So marginal, so utility is nothing but we are just giving a number to uh, the consumer satisfaction. Say for example, I consume a good and what value do I have for that good? Like, uh, suppose I uh, spend 10 rupees to uh, buy a product, but the good might be worth more, a lot more than 10 rupees for me. So what the good is worth for me, what satisfaction I'm deriving out of the good is known as my, mar uh, is known as my utility. And marginal utility is nothing but the additional satisfaction gained on consuming one additional unit of good. So it was all concerned about the consumer satisfaction, how much the consumer is feeling satisfied on consumption of a particular good. That was what the neoclassical approach was based on. Now, it said that the competition led, uh, leads to efficient allocation of resources by balancing demand and supply. It said that the free market is very uh, efficient in its own way and if we just balance the demand and supply as we've been doing in demand and supply 
normally. So if this is my demand curve and this is my supply curve, then I can easily achieve the equilibrium price and that is how the value of a product should be set. So this is what the neoclassical approach said and that is what we st st still uh, study till today. And if we can draw a valid comparison between the neoclassical approach and the classical approach, we can see these are two sides of the same. Uh, uh, these are two sides of the same diagram, basically. So the classical approach was concerned more towards the supply side. It said that the production cost should be considered while valuing the product. But the neoclassical approach says that the uh, value of a product should be determined by what the uh, consumer puts value on the product. So it should not be based on the production cost, rather it should be based on the marginal utility and the uh, total satisfaction that I, uh, derived from a pro uh, consumption of the product. We also have a, a, a principle to get the maximization of utility that we will be, uh, we'll be studying in the ra consumer rationality and behavior chapters in the further uh, coming uh, weeks. But this is the uh, basic idea of what utility means and how it functions in the price determination. Now, uh, it, will, it, it is obviously still used, we do study it uh, to the, today in microeconomics, but it was still criticized after the financial crisis of 2008 and that is when the Keynesian theory came up. That is why the Keynesian theory is very important because it helps us understand factors that are way beyond the microeconomics, that are into the ma macroeconomics, that study the entire nation at once and not just one particular firm or one particular uh, product valuation is not just studying in, in macroeconomics. In macroeconomics we consider aggregate demand and aggregate supply and that is what the Keynesian theory is based on. It, uh, it also takes into account the aggregate demand, aggregate supply, monetary policies and uh, interest rates. So all these factors are considered under the Keynesian theory. But the classical theory mainly was all about the valuation of a product, how the producer and consumer come together to decide at one particular product, uh, value of a product. That is what the classical uh, approach and the, and the classical theory was mostly based upon. That's all for today. We're going to continue from here in the next video. If you found this video useful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you in the next video.